Okay, not yet. <laughs> I was looking for the light. Okay, I think we're on now. Good morning, everyone, uh, here in the United States at least, and everyone else who's joining us from different parts of the world. Good, whatever part of the day it is to you. Uh, we are really excited to have you all here today on this Hangout, uh, hosted by the Half the Sky Movement, that we're going to be discussing the causes and consequences of sex trafficking as well as things that we all can be doing to address it. Uh, it's fitting, of course, that we're having this Hangout this month, uh, at least here in the United States. This is the uh, National Slavery and Human Trafficking Prevention Month, in which all Americans are encouraged to educate themselves about all forms of modern slavery. Um, it's also fitting for us here at the Freedom Center, and I should introduce myself. My name is Luke Blocher. I'm with the National Underground Railroad, Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, we are an organization that's dedicated to telling the stories of freedom's heroes from the era of the Underground Railroad through to contemporary times. And we're just so excited to be working with Half the Sky Movement today because both of our organizations really are focused around telling stories uh, to advance freedom. Uh, Half the Sky, as I think everyone on this call hopefully knows, uh, is an organization that at its core uses stories to end the oppression of women and girls around the world. And as I said, we at the Freedom Center are an organization that uses stories uh, really uh, beginning in the era of the Underground Railroad but continuing through to today to help people be inspired and empowered to make changes. Uh, we have an incredible panel here today that I'm going to introduce very shortly. Um, I think you're all going to be very excited. I hope most people on this call probably know all these people because they're they're certainly all heroes of mine, and heroes of many of the people um, who care about this issue around the world today. Uh, I want to tell you very briefly about the Freedom Center before we jump into the panel and the discussion, and I'll tell you also about how the, how the questions are going to work at the end of the discussion. Uh, but we at the Freedom Center, again, we are in Cincinnati, and we're an organization that uses stories uh, to inspire people to take courageous steps for freedom today. And ultimately what that means for us is that we want to use stories of people like Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, uh, John Parker, heroes of the Underground Railroad era of United States history, people who stood up to injustice and helped bring an end to legal slavery in this country. We want to use those stories to help inspire and empower people to take courageous steps for freedom today. And we do that by connecting with uh, contemporary issues as well, and particularly with the issue of modern slavery and human trafficking. And we tell stories of people like Prem Vanak, uh, from Cambodia, who we featured recently in a documentary film called Journey to Freedom, who himself escaped uh, a situation of forced labor and is now uh, using stories and using his art to help people become inspired to change this around the world today. Uh, I think our ultimate goal here is that when, with, at the Freedom Center, is that when we tell these stories, uh, that you understand, you people on this call, the people who are as part of this panel, everyone who's trying to address this issue around the world, uh, that when you stand up and try to take a stand against this injustice, uh, you're not doing it by yourself. You're joining a really strong historical legacy of people standing up for freedom and justice around the world. And, and ultimately, you're standing on their shoulders when you do that. And so I think that for us is a really empowering message, and one that we try to drive home in everything we do. We certainly believe all three panelists we have today qualify as heroes, certainly by our definition at the Freedom Center. I'm going to tell you a little bit about each one of them, and then we're going to jump into our talk today. The first is Rachel Lloyd. Rachel is the founder and CEO of GEMS, the Girls Educational Mentoring Services. Uh, this is the nation's largest organization offering direct services to American victims of child sex trafficking. GEMS empowers girls and young women aged 12 to 24 who have experienced commercial sexual exploitation and domestic trafficking, trafficking to exit the sex industry and develop their full potential. Rachel is a renowned expert, regular speaker, and lecturer. Uh, in fact, her advocacy has been the subject of a documentary called Very Young Girls and her own memoir called Girls Like Us, which was released in 2011. Uh, she herself is a survival of commercial sexual exploitation, and like so many of the heroes we honor in the Underground Railroad, uh, her st her, she has turned her story into one of empowerment uh, for people in this country, and it's an incredible one, and I look forward to hearing from her today. Our second panelist, again, is someone I think everyone on this call, I hope, is very familiar with. Uh, again, and a real personal hero of mine, Somali mom. Um, Somali is in Cambodia, and she has dedicated her life um, to saving victims, building shelters, and programs for healing, and ultimately empowering survivors um, of commercial ex sexual exploitation in Cambodia. Uh, she founded an organization in 1996 called uh, AFESIP, which is Aguirre pour les femmes en situation précaire, 
uh, that organization is, um, which was featured in the Half the Sky Movement documentary, uh, is um, giving hope and survival and strength to to thousands of girls in Cambodia today, and it's an incredibly powerful story. Uh, she also uh, founded the Somali Mom Foundation in 2007, which is a funding mechanism for for her work and an uh, international platform for her work. Uh, among the many, many, many awards she has won, uh, Somali has been honored one of, as one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in 2009 and a CNN hero. Our last panelist is Nicholas Kristof, uh, a columnist for the New York Times since November 2001. I'm introducing everyone, although I hope and, 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 and I'm sure that all of you know who these folks are because they are such incredible heroes. Uh, Nick has won the Pulitzer Prize twice. Um, in 1990, he won it with his wife, Cheryl Wudun, for their work covering the Tiananmen Square massacre. And in uh, a movement in 2006, um, his work covering the genocide in Dorfor also won a, a Pulitzer. Uh, Nick's book, Half the Sky, Turning Oppression into Opportunity for Women Worldwide, of course, is the inspiration for the Half the Sky movement uh, and the inspiration for the Half the Sky exhibit, which is actually now at the Freedom Center here in Cincinnati through the end of March. I encourage anyone to come visit. It's an incredible, powerful exhibit. Uh, ultimately, Nick is someone who, at really a great personal risk, is shining a light on the condition of many of the most hopeless people in this world. And for that, it's something that uh, I'm internally grateful and uh, internally inspired by. Um, of the many, 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 many awards Nick has won, the most recent one, I think, will be received from us at the Freedom Center. Uh, in March, he'll be honored as an international, with, the, with the International Freedom Conductor Award which is an award we give out every couple years to uh, notable international figures advancing justice. Uh, this year, Nick will be honored with the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth at a gala in Cincinnati on March 2nd. Of course, uh, previous winners of that award for us were uh, the Dalai Lama in 2010 and Presidents George H. W. Bush and Bill Clinton for their tsunami relief work, and Rosa Parks was uh, the very first recipient of that award. Again, an incredible panel. I could spend the entire time talking about the work they've done, but I think what we all want to do is get to some discussion about uh, what they're doing. Uh, well, the way the program is going to work is we're going to have about 30 minutes of questions with the folks on the panel, and then uh, 10 minutes or so each, and then we're going to have answer the questions from you all in the crowd uh, who are posting either on Facebook or on uh, Half the Sky Movement's Facebook page, Half the Sky Movement's Google Plus page, and also this is being live streamed on Half the Sky Movement's YouTube page. So with that, I'm going to jump into the questions uh, for Rachel first. Um, Rachel, I think is, uh, in popular culture, at least, there's a lot of folks who believe, who look at uh, sex trafficking primarily as a foreign issue, at least from a United States perspective. And of course, your work and your experience demonstrates this is very much a domestic issue. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the situation in the United States uh, with regards to the sex industry and sex trafficking? Hey, am I on? You are on. Yes? Yes, you are. No, just me myself. I'm good. Okay. Um, I mean, first of all, just really happy to be on, uh, on the panel with Somali and Nick, who I have a lot of respect for. Um, I think you're right at the people tend to see this as an international issue it's beginning to change people's perception and we've done a lot of work and there's organizations that have been doing a lot of work for the last couple of years in helping people recognize this as a domestic issue there's an estimated 100 to 300,000 young people at risk for commercial sexual exploitation in this country each year um, I think one of the reasons why this hasn't got the attention in the U.S. that it maybe should have done um, is that who it impacts. It impacts low-income kids, it impacts kids of color, kids who've been in the juvenile justice system, in the child welfare system, kids who are already seen as runaway, homeless, throwaway kids. Um, so the young people that it impacts tend not to be high on anybody's priority list already. And so I think that's allowed us in the U.S. to be able to kind of look in the other direction. Um, but I do think that there's a, a, a sea change and a shift in the last year or two um, in terms of people recognizing that the, the issues that we care about overseas are actually happening two, three blocks away um, from mm us. Uh, sort of building off of that, off of that reality, um, you know, 
Of course, one of the major contrasts between historic chattel slavery and what's happening today is that what is that slavery is, of course, very legal today uh, in the U.S. and around the world, and yet, as we're discussing it, it persists. What more do you think, um, in the in the domestic setting, can state and local policymakers and laws for law enforcement be doing? What what is what should what should be the focus, perhaps, if it isn't right now, or what are the things that can work? I mean, I, one of the things that we were on over the last few years and we're really proud to pass was the Safe Harbor Act, which meant that young people in New York were no longer prosecuted as criminals but were treated as children in need of services um, when they were arrested for an act of prostitution at the age of 12, 13, 14 mm -hmm. years old. Now, they couldn't even legally consent to sex under statutory rape laws and yet traditionally they were charged with an act of prostitution and we were seeing them go to jail for a year, two years, and the men who had bought them and the men who had sold them go free. Um, New York passed that in 2008. Since then, we've seen 10 other states pass safe harbor legislation, um, vacating convictions um, legislation that passed in New York and a couple of other states in the last couple of years is critical. One of my young women actually this week, uh, who I've known since she was 12 and had a very long record of prostitution arrests, all when she was a child, um, was just able to get all her convictions erased because she's a victim. she was a victim of trafficking. So legislation that supports um, survivors as victims and doesn't criminalize them is critical and that erases those criminal histories so that they can start again and move forward um, in their lives is really important, but we also have to remember this isn't an issue that we can legislate our way out of or prosecute our way out of, um, right? We can create all the laws we want, but we have to be doing something on the ground and changing people's perceptions as well. That's yeah, an incredibly important point, and certainly what, what we, we aim to do at the Freedom Center. What, what is it that you think, um, on that front, what is the kind of things that you think are the most effective that if you're, for the, for the 500 or so, or I don't know how many more are tuned in today, and other people are going to watch this later and are looking for, uh, in their communities perhaps, what are the things that they, you know, they're not in positions of authority necessarily, but what are the things that they can and should be doing that can help advance the on-the-ground work that you're referencing that really is what's going to tip the balance here? Are there some examples of things you would suggest people to kind of... I mean, I think yeah, I think educate yourself as much as possible, um, right? And there's books out there and films out there and articles and all kinds of things that you can now um, access as resources to learn about this issue. I, we have a lot of people who ask us if they can come and volunteer and help rescue trafficked girls in the middle of the night. Um, I, I generally point them in the direction of Big Brother, Big Sister. If people were doing more mentoring of five, six, seven, eight-year-olds, um, that would be like really important prevention work and that doesn't seem as exciting or, or, or as sexy sometimes but we have to be doing the really kind of on the ground work that makes a difference. Um, find out you know what's happening in your local community and then beginning to get involved in as many areas as you can, right? Poverty impacts our young people, race and class impacts our young people and so the what you may be called to do or what you, the, the, the way you can best help may not be riding around in the middle of the night with a van scooping up girls um, but it may be going to tutor at your local elementary school or junior high school and helping your people graduate from high school, mm. um, right? It may be employing young people in your, in your place of employment. Um, there are so many different things that people can do and so I think if we can think about this issue broadly um, and not just kind of in, in the sense of like freeing people but creating a world and a community where our children and our adults are able to live free, I think that's the, the most important thing people can do. That's a really incredibly powerful point. Um, and I think one that, it, you know, for all the reasons you just mentioned, has to be driven home many times. Can you, can you talk a little bit about, because you have such an incredible amount of experience with your organization with this, can you talk about what are some of the ways that, particularly in this country, that, that, that young people can become vulnerable to this? So I think uh, when you think about it being something that's far away, you don't see how it could, what, how could it happen to someone here? But obviously it is happening. So what kind of things lead people to be vulnerable? 
Um, I mean, the girls that we serve and that we've served over the last 15 years overwhelmingly have histories of childhood sexual abuse, trauma in the home, childhood neglect. Um, they're, they're growing up incredibly vulnerable. Over 70% of the young people that we serve have been in the child welfare system um, which has so many challenges and we need to be reforming our child welfare system um, across the board and so those first 10 years of a child's life where they're being sexually abused they're moving from foster home to foster home um, and then they hit 12 13 and along comes a man who pays attention to them who makes them feel loved um, who makes them feel wanted probably for the first time their introduction into the commercial sex industry um, and, and as they grow up in the commercial sex industry people are less interested and care less about the six-year-old whom people may have had sympathy for um, because she was a victim of sexual abuse now she's 15 16 and she's seen as a quote-unquote prostitute right that's when they're getting criminalized I mean one of our, our girls actually watched a video of, of Somalis girls talking about their experiences and how they entered the the commercial sex industry and how they got trafficked and our girls were like bawling saying this is my story this looks right my mom didn't want me there was poverty at home I ran away or, or I met a guy and then everything changed um, so the more work we can do on prevention and early intervention, I think, is, is really critical for our young people. Hmm. That's powerful. Well, I'm going to move on to Somalia, but we'll be back, Rachel, um, as we go towards the Q&A from the audience later uh, with more questions for you, I'm sure. Um, Somalia, this next question is for you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, jumping off of Rachel's comments, um, she mentioned uh, uh, her girl, the, the girls that she works with seeing the stories of your girls. Can you tell us a little bit about the work you do um, and, the sto and the stories of the girls that you are helping in Cambodia. Um, the, what we do, you know, is like I agree with Russia. It's not easy to 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 talk to the to the girl who have been in the brothel a long time or short time because first of all they are completely broken. Secondly, they don't believe you who you are. They've been always have their own pen for. So our work today is like we try to be going to the brothel with our group. And most of them are they are survivor of sex trafficking, so we're going to the browser, try to empower them to leave because you know you can take five minutes to save them, but after save them, what are you going to do with them and then sometimes also even you see them like on a browser and then you always feel that they are free they can they can they can get out of the browser. But they are not free in their mind because they are completely broken. Who helped them? They have psychology, they have counseling, no one there. No one can understand them. So our work is going to empower them. You know, listen to them. Listen to them that is the best way. Believe them that, we, that is the best way. Trust them. And then day by day, and then when you give them trust and trust, even they lie to you, but you have to do. Go back, try to empower them. Day by day, some of them escape from the brothel. So um, after escape from the brothel, they have many work to do with them. So we have the center. It's not just about giving them giving them work or training, but it's about also empower empower them, being with them all time. You know, when you look at this kid, at this woman, don't look at them as their victim. Look at them as a human being, and then how you take care of your your own kid. You have to take care of them the same way, the same way. Pay attention talk to them, you spend many time with them, so it's not easy to work with um, victim of sex trafficking. It's not easy to, to, to get all this success. So in, we have the center that we provide them all the skill, all the skill training, psychology, education, because in Cambodia most of the girls who have, they don't have education. And then after, of course, like around the question with, with the business, uh, follow up for years and years and years, you know, more than 10 years, we still follow up them too. Um, can you, those are really powerful stories, and I think Rachel and uh, Somali are both pointing to this being, I think, this, this point that this isn't simply about dramatic rescues, it's about reintegrating and rehabilitating people and individuals and loving those people, um, and I think uh, clearly Somali, you're doing that in a really powerful way. Um, 
Can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, when I, your story is such a powerful one. Your personal story is such a powerful one. And, and to me and to someone who is at our organization is steeped in the history of, of the Underground Railroad movement, um, you, are, uh, you are very much like uh, heroes like Harriet Tubman who escaped, the underground, escaped slavery in the United States and then went back again and again and again to rescue people. Uh, can you can you just tell us a little bit about your story? Because I think for me, at least, it's a really inspirational one, and I think the more people hear it, um, the better. I get a little bit old to talk about my story, right? Sure. <laughs> you know, I was yeah, I was in the brothel a long time, and then in the brothel, I just want to talk about the life in the brothel. Sure. When you're in the brothel, you have you have no idea how to escape. You have no idea how how you move, you lie on, because you survive day by day. And then you even don't know why you survive. Because you, my my head is completely broken. I don't know who, who I am exactly. Staying to have like clients, to have sex every single day. Stay around the girl, have the same story. No one can talk about about our, our future. We never talk about the future. So we are like slave. The brothel owner asks us to have a client. So if you can have a client, ten client, or twenty client a day, that is the best way for them. And then I don't know how to explain to you, but in the brothel, it's completely dark. It's a dark way. You cannot see light. You cannot see hope. Any hope, you cannot. And then I just want also to share the people to understand that when. When I was in the brothel myself, I never want to escape from the brothel. Why I have to escape from the brothel? For whom? For what? Who can help with myself? And then that is like no one can understand it. Everyone just thinking about, oh, she's in the brothel, she can, she can go out. Oh, she has sex with the client, that she's great. Not about the greatness, because we feel nothing. We feel nothing about ourselves. And then all this smelling, all this client, all this violence is made of a memory is very dark, very darkness. So for myself today, I just I feel that I'm lucky to have a lot of people around supporting myself and my girl. They improve, you know. They to see realities mean like my girl. They going to to school. They going to universities. Make my life better life. And then this work, you know, like my life, what I have been through. I have two decisions. One is come with suicide because how you can open your eyes with all the rape, with all the spam, smile, with all the other people around you, hating you all the time. And then second life is like, what I'm doing now is helping other people, helping myself. I can understand them better than anyone can understand them. So it's, it is not easy to, to escape, it is not easy to stand up, it is not easy to hear. Everyone can say maybe we are here, we are here but we are not exactly like you. We work from our heart, and then my life, I just try to make all the girls who were suffering. No one can understand what is suffering from sex slavery when you had a client beating you and rape you. No one can understand that. So if one day, if today I can save one of them out of the brothel and make their life better, and they can be, you know, happy. We cannot be happy and very happy, but they can be happy. They have their life meaningful. That is the best way. Saving the life, that is the best way. Hmm. Well, I appreciate you telling that story again. Um, you've been now since 1996 doing this incredible work. Can you say anything about what you've seen change in that time or what, uh, what you would like, what hasn't changed and what you wish had changed in Cambodia? What is changing right now is worldwide talking about sex trafficking. And for that, I have to say thank you to Nate with your book and your support. I'm not speaking English at all. Um, I see it's changing like the people they talk more about trafficking. In my own country, it's changing because right now the government they get more involved on this issue. And then we have even, you know, the government, they even, um, they recognize that in Cambodia they have the traffic. Even they have 12 December, a trafficking day. We have the government, they participate on trafficking day. It's not like, don't be like, okay, everything's going good. Everything going. We have to have hope. We have to have this hope. And we have to go. We have to, we have to be suffer to take the people understand and address on this issue. 
You know, sometimes if you want to end sex life, you cannot fight and fight. But you can find like soft way, make the people understanding, get the people involved on the reality. So in Cambodia, it's, it's like right now the government, they recognize it. It's not the all of them, but still have I have hope. We have also the students who get involved with voice for change, with one with the group of our survivors. We have pop star, we have many people right now get involved on the on the trafficking. So it's get very better. On Facebook I saw like, everyone talking about trafficking and you know, everywhere. I'm so happy that the people can understand it. But one thing that I need more, I need more people to understand what is a victim life like how to help them, how to save and help them. It's easy to take one victim out and then you do whatever you want, but listen to them, give them voice, give them choice, give, because they need to talk. Powerful, thank you. Um, Somali, I'm going to move on to Nick right now, but um, we will be back um, for certain for more questions. As I've seen the questions pile up, there are a lot of questions for you directly um, that we'll get to uh, at the end of the chat. Um, I'm now going to move to Nick Kristoff. Um, Nick, a lot of things we could talk about here. Um, I think one jumping off point is following Rachel and Somali both describing uh, the situations in two different countries, uh, similar but different. Can you, you know, you've reported on both of these things around uh, and around the world. Can you talk a little bit about what some of the underlying similarities and differences are between what's happening in the U.S. and what's happening in places like Cambodia. Sure, I mean, um, one of the differences is that brothels in other countries are more likely to physically um, lock up girls, and that's because the model in other countries tends to be that customers go to a uh, brothel and have sex there. The model in the U.S. tends to be one, uh, one goes somewhere else, but the commonality is the way the traffickers or the pimps uh, control these girls and the kind of psychological uh, manipulation and pressures whether it's in Phnom Penh or, or in New York is remarkably similar and that's sort of one thing I've, I've grown to appreciate. And I think it's one thing that is um, misleading about the impression that people have in the US. I think people you know understand that when a girl is physically locked up in a brothel in India for example that that is you know, truly modern slavery. But when they are walking by Times Square and they see a girl in provocative clothing, um, you know, without anybody holding a gun to her head, they think, well, she's there voluntarily. And I think only in recent years are people getting to appreciate um, the degree to which that girl is indeed um, on and off uh, truly physically controlled by that pimp, it's not some kind of a business partnership, and um, and you know it, it. The police need to respond as such, as Rachel as Rachel said. The you know the the traditionally the priority for police has been to go and grab some of the girls on the streets and not go after the pimps, and that has to change. And I think it's beginning to change. Hmm. Sort of going in the, in, the, in the same direction. You, I think Rachel brought up the point at the beginning of this conversation around. This, this isn't simply a let's pass more laws solution. Uh, it has to be something that is, that is organic and from the ground up, on, and that can mean a lot of different things. So much of your work has been, and one of the reasons we're honoring you at the Freedom Center, it has been to uh, bring that truth to people so they can react to it and so they can do something, uh, much like you know, Harry Beecher Stowe did with Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, from your perspective as someone who is this truth teller, how does that, how does, how do we go from, having people be aware to some sort of tangible changes happening. I mean, is, are, are there certain mechanisms of public pressure that this, that this brings to bear? Or what's yeah. the, when this works the best way, how does it work? Um, you know, because we in America tend to live in a nation of laws, I think we tend to assume that when we've got a problem, the solution is usually a legal one. And I must say that as I've uh, watched the world you know, over the years, I've increasingly come to think that maybe we over-rely on the, the law uh, toolbox in trying to address global problems. Um, and you know we're more likely to reach for a new UN covenant or uh, some new legal solution. And in much of the world, laws kind of work in the capital and have almost no writ outside the capital. Um, in um, Cambodia, I I believe uh, Somali that um, 
that prostitution is illegal, and in fact, of course, it's it's ubiquitous. Um, in terms of how one goes about bringing that change, I think it is you know a broad combination of um, empowerment uh, of girls, educating girls, for example, globally. Um, and none of these are quick fixes, obviously. But as I noted in my column today, um, just one percent of the amount of money that we in the U.S. spent on the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, just one percent of that sum spent each year on global education would eliminate, uh, for the first time in history, the, the the primary education gap and end global the scourge of global illiteracy. And that would make a real difference on trafficking globally. I mean, it, it struck me in interviews in India, for example, the degree to which the pimp model requires on kidnapping illiterate girls because they're obedient. They don't run away. They don't have the, the mechanism. Um, it's much less profitable, if you will, for uh, the traffickers to kidnap girls who are even have a, you know, a fifth grade education uh, because they're much more resistant. They're more likely to figure out a way of getting to the police and getting the traffickers in trouble. So things like global education abroad, uh, in this country, addressing uh, these the underlying inequality and, and, and poverty in, in this country, I think, begin to address it. A more proximate level, uh, I think, um, changing the cost-benefit calculations for uh, pimps and traffickers. And that means um, going after them, uh, putting them in jail, um, I think, is the surest way of, of making a, a real difference. And, and that can be, um, in the Philippines, there was a study involving um, going after pimps who had underage girls. And indeed, um, as it kind of makes sense, the pimps figured out pretty quickly what was going on and um, began to bring in adult women rather than underage girls, uh, responding to the incentives out there. I think we can, you know, I think we can, I think we can do that. We can make a, a, a real difference out there. We're not going to eliminate the problem, but we sure can reduce it. Well, and on, on that score, um, you kind of laid out a, a, a dichotomy between a response that is to pass laws or pass a, uh, an international treaty or international uh, uh, obligation of some sort, and then actual funding decisions by governments to invest in um, some sort of prevention or some sort of addressing of, of the causes. Um, and it seems like we're at a point where there's been more of a response on the legal side, less of a response on the funding side, I mean, to speak very broadly. Um, can you think of, of something that you know would help tip that balance in some way? Are there ways that we can be pushing forward to help tip the balance where governments are you know forced to respond with a little in a little more meaningful ways or more meaty ways? Well, I mean, I, I frankly think that there really has been progress both abroad and at home, and I think that is partly because the issue has gotten more attention, and because naming and shaming uh, really does work. That uh, countries are embarrassed to think of themselves as um, oases of modern slavery. Um, and American cities and states are embarrassed when they become known for that. Um, we, um, the United States has put out this trafficking persons report uh, each year for the last dozen years. And I think that has been a pretty powerful tool to embarrass other governments. And it's not as if they then immediately clean up the act uh, totally. But they do begin to send message down that they begin to think about this issue for the first time. Uh, there was one brothel in uh, Poi Pat, Cambodia, that I came to know quite well because I was reporting there regularly. I got to know the, the owner quite well. And it struck me that um, because of this pressure on the Cambodian government, it wasn't that anybody arrested this woman who was a, a known trafficker. It wasn't that they closed her brothel, but the local police began demanding more and more in bribes from her to keep her brothel open. And, you know, she's a profit-maximizing businesswoman, and all those um, bribes interfered with her business model. And she eventually herself got out of the trafficking business and, and closed down her brothel because she could make more money doing other things, um, selling lottery tickets, pirating videos, uh, who knows, stealing motorcycles, whatever else it may have been. Um, and, you know, in the same way, I think we can uh, name and shame other countries. Um, you know, right now, there's a lot of attention on the, this gang rape victim in India, for example. And I think it's worth pointing out that the 
biggest rape problem in India isn't middle class women being attacked. It's uh, the red light districts all over India where uh, both Indian girls and foreign women, uh, Bangladeshis, Nepalis, are trafficked into these places and raped uh, you know, many, many, many times, and uh, in many cases, truly are physically locked up uh, in those brothels. So, I'm a, I'm a great believer in uh, naming and shaming as a way of bringing about progress. Hmm. And, and building off that, do you think there is? Um, you you laid out a, a great tool uh, in naming and shaming. Is there something that, and, th and that that is happening right now to effect? Is there something that isn't happening, um, you know, on, on, on either an international level or a domestic level, uh, either by a government or by um, some other sorts of organizations that you think could be happening right now but isn't for whatever reason? It's something that people could take up right now or could advocate for. People like us could advocate to start happening that isn't happening right now. Sure. Um, a couple of things that come to mind. I mean, one is that it is incredibly frustrating that uh, because of the political polarization in the U.S., you have um, people on the left doing great work on trafficking and people on the right doing great work on trafficking, but they really don't cooperate very much um, because there is such distrust uh, among them. And these efforts would be so much more effective if left and right managed to hold their nose and work together on an issue that you know they, that they both care about and indeed both do good work on, that um, they may disagree about elements of this, but they surely both agree that 14-year-old um, girls shouldn't be uh, pimped out, whether in Cambodia or in the U.S. And um, I think greater efforts uh, by both left and right on outreach to, to cooperate on this would make a, a, a real difference. Um, and the other uh, thing, I guess, um, is, um, well, Rachel mentioned the safe harbor uh, laws, for example, and and more broadly, you have some jurisdictions in the U.S. that are now really doing a pretty good job. Um, it really turned a new leaf uh, on this. Um, you have a lot of places around the country that are still completely ignoring pimps and are just going after those girls in the street. Um, and I think you know one thing I would encourage people to do if they're watching is to find out what they're local uh, police and prosecutors uh, do and ask questions uh, about this. And I think that if we can um, create a more unpleasant environment for uh, pimps around the country, uh, boy, that would be tremendous progress for us all. Well, there's a question, thank you, Nick, um, for our to-do list. Um, there's a question, I'm going to jump to some of the questions from the um, crowd. And actually, a couple ones came in that are very much in line with what you were just saying there at the end. And they have to do with the issue of demand for prostitution and whether what are the things that um, you know, and I would ask this to all three of you are the things that we uh, that you all that you all think can and should be done on that score. Uh, Rachel, I'll let you go first um, on this. Oh, yeah, I was dying to address demand, actually. Um, I mean, I think it's critical that we strengthen... I mean, A, it's illegal to, um, to solicit for, for prostitution across the country other than a couple of counties in Nevada. Um, so those laws are on the books. They're just not being put into effect because we don't see men who buy sex from women and children um, as doing anything really wrong. We see it as just kind of like boys will be bored. So we need to change our attitudes about it. Um, and right, while you may have one pimp, you've got hundreds of men who buy you, um, and and those are just as culpable as the pimp or the trafficker who sold you. Um, so it's really critical that we change our attitudes, that we socialize boys and young men differently, um, that we don't teach boys and young men that they are they have the right to purchase other human beings that it's harmless that right it's you know that that no one's it's a victimless crime that no one's getting hurt um, so I mean I think both from an education standpoint and being able to talk about us in our communities with our brothers our fathers our sons our neighbors um, this tends to be an issue that when I speak or when I'm at a meeting it's all 
overwhelmingly women. Um, and we need to see more, most men aren't buying sex, right? And so we need to see more of the good men who are not buying sex standing up um, and getting involved and, and encouraging their peers to change their perception about this issue. Mm. Uh, that's powerful. Somali, um, can I ask you the same question from your perspective? How, do, how does addressing demand fit into this uh, equation? Uh, Renee, I think I saw that Somali might have been muted by accident. I see him. Well, let's go to Nick while they while they fix Somali's um, microphone. Sure, um, sure. Nick, can you jump in, and then we'll go to Somali. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I, I agree with what Rachel said, and one tool that I think has been useful in addressing the demand side has been um, these John schools that have been started in a number of cities, and the idea is that a lot of Johns um, delude themselves into thinking that. You know, these girls love uh, having sex with me. Uh, they're there completely of their own free will. And so um, the judge sentences first offense to a day in which they hear from survivors what trafficking is really like. And um, the uh, experience in places like San Francisco, uh, like Brooklyn, has been really positive that recidivism um, because. These Johns are really kind of startled and, and taken aback by uh, to, to, to realize what it act, what actually goes on, and it suddenly becomes um, less sexy and more um, kind of shameful. And uh, so, I, you know, I'd like to see more of these John schools uh, around the country as one way of chipping away at demand and at the attitudes that underlie that demand. Hmm. Somali, I think you're back on. Do you want to uh, take a stab at this question? Yeah. For my side, it's like, you know, we have to educate men and boys. Of course, that our work also, we have a voice for change. We're going to talk to the men, educate men, and also um, young boy, young children it, at school. By, talk, by sharing, first of all, their own story, because in Cambodia, sometimes they don't realize it because of the culture, because of many things. So sometimes men who beat the women, they don't know that that the women have been hurt. We don't have like the same right like you have in, in, in US and Europe. So we try to talk to them, educate them, and we're starting and we see the changing, some changing from our from our side men here. So I don't want to to see like we need to again men or not, but we need to educate them. We need to get them involved. If you want to changing, if you want to stop trafficking, we have to have men with us. Uh, another similar question. Uh, thank you all for those for those for those answers. And I think what's striking about all those is there's a simple, uh, not simple to execute, but simple in concept idea of just telling people what's really happening, and that that has a big that has a big impact. Uh, another question that has to go sort of with the, the tools of this uh, comes ar around the question of um, the online selling of people, essentially. Uh, and that, um, you know, particularly, I know this is a question in the United States and around the world as well. That sex trafficking is happening um, with online sales. Do you think, you know, and I'll ask this question again of everybody. Do you think this is something that people should join around? Uh, the question from the audience is: Should people be joining around together to pretty aggressively try to stop this? Um, things like I think in the uh, in the U.S. there's a question of back page and. Uh, Craigslist and and and, or, and uh, tools like that, online tools like that, is that something that we should all be coming together to pretty quickly and aggressively go against, or is there any complication with that? Um, I'll ask again, Rachel, that question first. Look, we we were definitely um, a part of kind of coming against Craigslist and, and Backpage. I'll say that the reality is, though, is that I, I don't feel like it's where the majority of our attention needs to be. I think if we were 
put in as much attention that goes into kind of campaigning against um, Backpage or Craigslist or any of these online sites and put that attention to kind of raising funding for services, empowerment, um, education, employment for girls and young women who are exiting the sex industry, um, and creating options so that people aren't online um, feeling like this is their only option. I think that would actually have a longer term impact. I think sometimes we can win the battle, but we don't win the war. And so you can have a short term victory. And look, I find Backpage offensive and I hate seeing my kids, I hate seeing kids, women on there being sold and, and, and right? I mean, I've seen women on there with like bruises and welts and I mean, clearly trafficked. Um, it's offensive and it needs to stop. But I am conscious that that isn't the long-term solution. Um, like Nick talked about investing in education, investing in you know the uh, closing the gender equity gap. Um, those are the things that I think again not as maybe like immediately satisfying as activists, but over long term, that's um, really going to make a difference. Nick, do you have anything to add to that? Um. Yeah, I mean, look, there are no silver bullets involved in trafficking either domestically or abroad. Um, in a sense, there is silver buckshot, and <coughs> the elements, <coughs> excuse me, um, <coughs> the uh, elements of that uh, buckshot, you know, include long-term preventative efforts uh, against poverty uh, to promote education. They include uh, better law enforcement approaches. They include efforts to address uh, demand. Um, uh, I think they also do include efforts to make it harder for pimps to market girls, and uh, that would include efforts to get the mainstream websites like Backpage to, uh, for example, require um, better um, ID to make sure that the girls marketed there really are um, um, uh, above the age majority, for example. Um, but this is all, you know. This is all a little bit like uh, you know pushing balloons down, and and uh, it makes a difference at the margins. Um, but um, there, you know, it's a it's a long war, and there's um, going to be no single decisive battle. I don't think. Mm -hmm. I think that's an incredible point. Um, uh, to really, it's something that's come through throughout our conversation that this that the problem is not one that's a simple, simply described or simply solved one. Uh, and that's that's true throughout history as well. It certainly is is not the case uh, that when the Thirteenth Amendment passed in the United States, all of a sudden uh, all the people who had been enslaved were in good situations and empowered to to become full members of the of, of the United States. And that's a process that's still going on to this day in many ways. Uh, and so I think we're we're really well served to think about this both in the really dramatic and imp impactful ways we can do immediate things, but also the, the way that that is not the entire solution and that this is a long um, battle needs to be kind of continuously fought uh, by all of us. Um, Somali, I, I want to ask a question for you directly that comes from the audience about, um, I think a lot of our audience is here in the United States, and they'd like to know, this question has come up a couple times, what can they be doing directly to support what you're doing in Cambodia? Um, they can go to, first of all, they can go to our website, somali.org, and then they can see everything. And then I just want them to, you know, to, to take attention on, on reading about the sex trafficking because it's not easy. Because some people, they just see it and then they get very excited to do it. But excited is great, but also exactly what you want to do exactly. Because these issues, it's not about excited, it's about patience, it's about compassion. So I just want to ask them to go to our website, somali.org, and then they can see we have many solutions that they can read and then it can get involved in that. Right. Well, please, everyone, do that immediately. Um, I'd like to ask one more question that's come up a couple times in the audience, and this is a tough one. Um, and it has to do with, and Rachel and Nick both touched on it a little bit, it has to do with whether or not um, women can, can genuinely choose to become part of prostitution, whether that's something that can be a choice, uh, and whether there is a way to differentiate um, people who make that tr conscious decision, or whether uh, I think by its very nature uh, it is an oppressive relationship in which uh, there really cannot be a free will choice about that. Can, can either one of you talk to that uh, 
contentious issue. Maybe I'll ask you, Rachel, first. I mean, I, I'll, yeah, I'll say that. I mean, I, look, do I think that there are women who have, as adults, with options, with economic options, uh, and, and not a history of prior sexual abuse, made a choice to go into the sex industry? Yes. Do I think they're representative of the majority of women globally who end up in the sex industry? No. Um, right. What we know is that the sex industry recruits and aims for and targets the most vulnerable women and girls and boys and men around the world, um, right, whether it's through poverty, whether it's through war, whether it's through uh, mass genocide that they've experienced in their communities, whether it's through um, poverty in the U.S. and prior sexual abuse in the child welfare system, right, the, the sex industry does not make its money off the backs of middle class uh, educated college grads in the U.S. That's not the global billion dollar industry. It's making its money off children in Calcutta, off girls in Cambodia, off women in the Ukraine. And so in order to have choice, you have to have options. And so if, if you know, an adult makes a choice based on real options, it's not feed my kids or I go into the sex industry. Shall I starve? Should I be homeless? Are real options when you're back. For so many women and girls, it's about lack of options and lack of choices, and it isn't about choice. That isn't to, right. And and again, I will say that I do think there are folks whose stories are outside of that kind of uh, uh, description, but they um, they really are in the minority. Um, and so I think in, it's easy to argue about choice, but, but let's start with creating options for women and girls around the world, education options, employment, economic independence, all of those things, so that if people do end up making a choice, it's actually based on real options. Mm -hmm. Nick, do you need to add to that? Yeah, um, I mean, there's no question that there are women who um, are adults who sell sex um, uh, willingly, and and men who uh, sell sex willingly. And I, um, you know, and there is some debate about what to do with them. But I think that's not the priority for most of the people in this field. The priority is people who are underage and who are being uh, exploited. And because there are some people, some adults, who willingly sell sex. There is sometimes a notion that the way we should address this is to uh, legalize the sale of sex and regulate it, um, uh, provide health checkups, uh, provide regulations so that underage girls aren't um, aren't trafficked. And you know, on its surface, this has some appeal to me. Uh, at one point, I was attracted to that model, but the more you look at what happens when that model is implemented, the more it seems to turn out that uh, side by side with that um, legal trade in um, consensual sex, you have a black market uh, trade in underage girls and uh, trafficked uh, women. Um, you know, that is what has happened in the Netherlands, for example. And uh, it's what has happened in, in, in many parts of the world that have experimented with it. And so I, I've come to conclude, um, and I think a lot of people have, that you know, while the, uh, the issue of adults who sell sex voluntarily is, is not a priority to me, that the notion of a, a legally regulated sex market um, just frankly you know, doesn't work very well as a way to address this. Um, you know, I, I will say that there are parts of the world, I think it varies a great deal in, in where in the world you're talking about. In, um, uh, in China, there is a huge commercial sex industry, uh, but most of the women who sell sex are doing it more or less voluntarily, more or less consensually, and uh, they keep the, the, the money that they make from it. Um, in India, on the other hand, you have a vast sex industry, and the uh, entry into that uh, tends to be coercive. Uh, girls tend to be sold or, or, um, uh, or in some cases, kidnapped. Um, and, um, you know, I think that needs to be uh, the focus. And, and likewise in the U.S., overwhelmingly the entry into commercial sex is of underage uh, girls. 
Well, I think yeah, it's very valuable to hear this these perspectives. I think that is a, that is sort of one of the talking points of the way that kind of gets thrown out there when this issue gets discussed. And, and and I think to your point, Nick, tries to muddy something that really isn't very complicated when it comes down to it as far as the morality of the of the entire issue. Um, we've only got a couple minutes left here, and with that time, I wanted to just give each of you a chance to maybe say one last word to the. I think I'm guess I think we have. I'm not sure how many people we have. On, on the air, but I think it's a good amount. And so, and this, of course, is going to be recorded and, and shared on um, on uh, Half the Sky Movement's page as well as the Freedom Center's page after this. Um, so, any kind of closing thoughts from each of you um, in reflection on this discussion? I'll start with Somali. Um, I just want to answer a little bit about this question, you know, about uh, the question of Sarah. Um, they, they, I just want to, to explain to people that. You know, I work every single day with the girl who's still in the brothel, who that everyone call them free. I even bring it to this brothel. We have to understand that this girl is not about their choice, it's about also the options. And then we have to un understand also their background. Sometimes they have been raped or sold when they were very young. And then they stay in the brothel, they don't know where they're going. And they say it's, it's not meaning that they are free. So what I ask all and everyone to do is try to encourage them to leave, give them options. If they don't have it, go and take care of their health care. They um, protecting them from the from the violence, violence from everywhere. I don't know everywhere the clan, police, everyone. We have we need to be protecting them. We need also to um, help them, you know, to give maybe they cannot they, they cannot escape from from the brothel because some of them they they stay in the brothel too long. But we need to find out the solution is mean like give them some work, handwork or something working that they can they can get more money and less work on the on the second or three. That's what I just want to 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 to, to share with all of you. And my last word is like. I, I don't like to different anything. What I want is I love to help the girl, to help the people who need help, the people who don't need to try to empower them. And then I just want to have all the audience, I just want to ask each of you to listen, try to empower this victim to talk, listen to them, give them a voice, give them a joy, and then don't try to, don't try just to fight each other to have a reason. Who have a reason? Right now, we need to help them. It's not about the reason who are who are you know who are for man side or woman side. Don't talk about the men side, woman side. Talk about how to help these people. So, men or women, we have this. We have some boy also in the brothel too. Mm. So please, just like try to find a solution how to help them for long term, and then education is the best way. Publishing, like Nick, you right, you you are you are the <laughs> you are the big head. You can help me how to make the people aware, understand it. It's not easy to understand all of this problem. It's not easy to take to go out from the brothel. It's not easy to reintegrate it. It's not easy to take a success. It's not easy to stand up and talking. It's not easy to make the people understand it. So just try to keep and then listen to them one by one and analyze it and how to find the solution to help them. That all. And again, thank you and good night, everyone. Thank you, Somali. Thank you very much. Um, Rachel, uh, any closing thoughts from you? Yeah, I mean, we haven't had a chance. We've right so many topics to kind of cover in such a short space of time, um, but we haven't had a chance to really talk about how successful survivors can be when they're connected to services and support. Um, and I, you know, I know from Somali's work that she's seen a lot of success. I know from our work with Gems, we've seen a ton of success. And so, right, this idea that folks are perpetually damaged and are perpetual victims um, is just a misnomer, right? Our model is called victim to survivor, survivor to leader. It's about really ensuring that we're empowering um, survivors to even move past being a survivor. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's critical to recognize the work that is being done by survivors, um, both in the U.S. and globally, in terms of leadership around on this issue and when survivors are at the forefront of an issue right they're the experts in that all time will change the perception of who women and girls in the sex industry are. Hmm. 
Yeah, I wish we could have spent an entire hangout talking about that, actually, and hopefully maybe we can someday. Um, Nick, uh, final closing thoughts from you. Sure, uh, a couple of points. First of all, for those of you who are watching and you want to learn more about it, then um, Somali and Rachel have both written just superb memoirs uh, that I really uh, encourage you to, to read. They just give a wonderfully nuanced picture of, of what exactly goes on, and I think you can't uh, do better uh, than to, to read those memoirs um, by uh, Somali and, and Rachel. Um, I guess the last thing I would say is that I think there's sometimes a perception that this is sort of a hopeless cause, that uh, you know, prostitution is the world's oldest profession, and it's too bad, but this is human nature, we're just not going to make progress. Well, you know, um, we're not going to eliminate murder either, but we uh, certainly find it worthwhile to do what we can and to reduce the rates. And in the same way, look, I've seen in the last decade real progress uh, against sex trafficking abroad and at home. Um, we're not going to eliminate it, but we certainly can reduce the number of cases where you have 13-year-old uh, girls who are peddled like slabs of meat, whether in Delhi or in Phnom Penh or in New York. And um, it's, um, it's a process of chipping away at the problem uh, rather than a sort of a magic bullet approach. Um, but uh, I, you know, this is, this is a battle that we can, um, if not completely win decisively, that we can register tremendous progress on. And, and that is something that is already underway. Yeah, that's a very incredibly important point. And I think when we think about the history in our institution, if you look at the abolitionists in the 1820s and 30s in the United States, there was really no reason to believe there was much hope that slavery would ever be legal. And it was only 30, 40 years down the road. Um, but it was a really long, hard, difficult slog. But they chipped away day by day and town by town. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that, that, that message is one that's powerful and important and real and has historical precedent as well. Um, well, thank you all very much. This has been an incredible uh, hour. I hope everyone on the, on, on the, uh, in the audience has enjoyed as well, and I hope we get to do it again sometime soon. So with that, I think we'll sign off. Thank you all.